Welcome to the serialized audiobook, The Reef, written by Scott Sigler and Matt Wallace. Narrated by Scott Sigler. Hey, junkies. This is A Real Girl, and this is The Reef Q&A. Always yes. after every podcast, we do a Q&A episode. Mm -hmm. Scott Sigler, congratulations on finishing The Reef. Thank you very much. How Thank are you? Much. I'm good. Uh, it's Comic-Con here. So we're all a little bit shot out. We just had a junkie party last night, so people who came to Comic-Con got to hang out It was here. really fun. It was really yes. fun. I know that you mentioned on Facebook we had a little bit of a hiccup with, uh, I, uh, we were, I was on a vacation in West Texas. I, yes. uh, I had an animal jump out in front of the car. and A javelina. A javelina, which is a f kind of a fuzzy pig. It's a big fuzzy pig that weighs about 100 and 120 <laughs> pounds or so. Let's tell you what, just so that people don't think you're a wild butcher mm -hmm. murdering a fuzzy pig, let's yes. do this. It's a misshapen, gnarled, small boar. True, yeah. But anyway, jumped out in front of my car, and I ended up um, stuck for two weeks and two days in West Texas because it was so remote. It took that long for parts to come in. Yes. Um, and it was a little bit of an ordeal. I'm, I'm super happy to be home. What's, n what's crazy for me is normally uh, Comic-Con week is so, so busy for me uh, right. because I have a, another client. I work with another client. I do a lot of stuff at Comic-Con. It's also normally less busy for you because we kind of coordinate it so... You can have meetings, and you're busy, busy, but you're not under a deadline all the time and mm -hmm. things like that. And uh, I am exhausted by Saturday morning. This is Saturday morning of Comic-Con, and right. I am normally sh completely shot out. And this year, my other client didn't come to Comic-Con. You, you were under deadline, so you were only going to do a few panels, this, that, and the other. I thought, oh, this is easy peasy. <laughs> this is going to be totally the best Comic-Con ever. I'm gonna we're going to have a party because why not? Because I have the time. Right. I don't think I've ever been this tired in my whole life. <laughs> we will get, uh, we'll talk more about it in the future, but we will get a screenplay out of this someday called 4th of July in Ira Ann, Texas. 4th of July in Ira Ann, Texas. Now, point of order. Um, number one, we're a little shout out, so we're going to let this roll. Uh, and number two, we have new neighbors who have mm -hmm. two small children, mm -hmm. and one of them is uh, a very gassy baby. <laughs> we can assume. Poor little, poor little cries, baby. Cries a lot. So if you guys hear the baby crying over the top of things, I just wanted to point that out. There is no baby sacrifice going on in this apartment at this particular time. True. True. All those things are true as you've just stated them. Yes. All right. Uh, and like Scott said, because it's Comic-Con, because I, I literally drove overnight 16 hours to get back to not miss the the party last night and this so i'm a little tired scott's a little tired because he's under double deadline and he's going to comic-con we're gonna roll with a couple little Let's hiccups there it. instead of editing them out the so this is your spoiler alert everybody mm. listening to this the way that we do q a's is you are allowed to ask scott absolutely anything which means not just reef questions anything at all we're going to try and preface that so you know what it's about so that you can skip ahead 20 30 seconds if you haven't read the, the story that's about to be spoiled uh, and I think we'll get into it. Do you have anything else, Scott? No, just uh, just reiterating or iterating, excuse me, what you pointed out is if you do not have categorical knowledge of the Sigliverse, if you've not read all the books, we'll give you a heads up if anything's going to be a spoiler for books outside of the GFL. Uh, but be aware, there could be spoilers in here. So uh, let's get into it. Okay, so the first question comes from Derek Brookover. Mm -hmm. And he says, in many of your works, including Title Fight, The Reef, Earth Core, and some other GFL works, a knee injury is a recurring and sometimes limiting ailment for main characters. Yes. Does this stem from personal experience, your immersion in the sport of football, or something else? I would say all of the above. Number one, knee injuries and ankle injuries are uh, very limiting to professional athletes and football players, particularly football players who play in the skill position. So running backs, wide receivers, quarterbacks, not quite as much unless they're mobile. Once the knees go or the ankles go, uh, or the hamstring go, the Achilles, et cetera, your ability to make cuts can be drastically reduced. And in pro sports, the uh, just a difference of a fraction of a second in your speed can be the difference between you being a all pro and you being on the bench or completely out of the sport altogether. So we feature that a lot. You'll see it an enormous amount. You saw it in the NBA Finals recently when um, the Slim Reaper hurt his, uh, hurt his, Ach his Achilles. Yeah, hurt his Achilles, and it may... Screw up his may screw up his career. We'll have to see how he comes back from that. As far as personal experience, I have banged up everything 
in my wrestling career and some things in the, the football career. The wrestling career is more prominent because I'm a tiny human being. So I was able to do a lot better in wrestling than I did in football because I'm a tiny human being. But <laughs> you, you get a helmet to the knee and you have trouble. You can't extend your knee all the way or do a full leg fold for weeks. That impacts everything you're doing on a football field. It slows you down. It hurts all the time. It screws you through distraction. So knee injuries yes in that regard. All of the above. So yes, yes to all of the above. Um, as far as, other things now there's a lot of things that are being done with surgery uh, they're able to do a lot improve other knee injuries that would otherwise be career ending but it's still a very dramatic thing it'll always be a dramatic thing yeah i mean it's a very if you think about it it's just a physics wise it's a fragile piece of the anatomy mm-hmm. um okay so moving on kurt armbuster has this question um Uncle Johnny's subdermal tattoo must have some sort of, of neural interface and has been used to distract an opponent in at least one game in this series. Mm-hmm. Uh, yet, it is not considered a mod. So my question is, where is the line? What mods are considered illegal and what might be allowed? Well, I believe the contest you're referring to was not on a football field. And in the the GFL administration, the the people in the league over in the League of Planets who run the thing are going to determine that if you can do something verbally to distract your opponent, then if you can do something analogous to that visually, like flash a word or something like that, that's all the same thing. So unless they're going to put a gag order on players by saying words, if he's got words going across his face, that's not going to be illegal. And that's a thing that happens in today's NFL yep. all the time. And I think part of the issue... You know, I'm I'm obviously much newer at a f- as a football fan than you are, but part of it is they can't. You can speak quietly enough to the persons who who's lined up right in front of you, mm-hmm. that unless you mic everyone and have people actually listening for infractions, they yeah. can whisper something to their opponent that nobody will hear except for the opponent. And there's a lot of things you can say blatantly out loud. Uh, it, it just depends on tone. It depends on delivery. Depends on what subject matter you're talking about. But tr- people trying to get into the heads of their opponents is a constant nonstop thing. Richard Sherman's kind of famous for it, of trying to get into the head of the people that uh, he's covering. The other part of it where it's not a mod is because it doesn't impact physical performance and it is not a performance enhancing drug or modifier. So there's nothing about a subdermal tattoo that's going to make John Tweedy a better player or a more uh, a player more resilient to injury. Therefore, mm-hmm. it's all it's fair game. Fair. Uh, this next question is from Eric Stenzel, and he says, I love the reef. Congrats to you and Matt Wallace for such an exciting knuckle-busting romp. However, my question is GFL-related about the key. All right. Are all of the key players from the Empire, or are some included from the key rebels as well? I haven't seen anything on the galactic timeline that would suggest that they had ever kissed and made up. So I could imagine it would be challenging at best to have a big, heavy, strong, grumpy key from the different factions sparring on the field, let alone on the same team. There are players from the key Rebel Association in the GFL, uh, like like all things, like Quentin Barnes is from an incredibly racist, predominantly 98% human system. And that system is kind of in a state of perpetual ceasefire war with most of the other systems, yet they have a football league and they have citizens within their government who could give a damn about all these wars and political stuff. They just want to play ball, just like they have citizens who just want to go to work, just like they have citizens who want to come home to their family, want to earn a living, et cetera. Um, as with most, th- most things in the world, the people who are really hell bent on waging war and propaganda are just a, 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 a thin percentage of the elite of that country and rank and file just wants to get along and try and get theirs and try and get their family along. So you're definitely going to get members of both sides of the key empire key rebel association who are players. And some of them are going to carry those politics out of the field, but, but not too often. You don't see a yeah. whole lot of that in the NFL and the NBA. There's a, like a little bit of racism, for example, that carries over, but for the most part in pro sports, if you can do your job on the field, and you are not locker room poison. Nobody really gives a shit. And there's one. Of, you say this. You you didn't specifically say it here, but you say it often um, that we are looking. We are looking at the unfolding of all of this from a, an an outsider perspective. But mm-hmm. in reality, those players on the field, some of them are of European heritage, and some of them are from yep. you know the African nations or whatever. Where there was warring at one time, you know, there was the the Roman Empire and 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 manifest destiny here in the U.S. and all that stuff, but we don't think about that when we look at those players anymore because right. it was so long ago that we're right. not 
you know, people fought each other in civil wars in space too in, in the timeline, but mm-hmm. eventually that becomes less important as, or less important than the team camaraderie. Yeah, the, the, the history of the Sigilverse and the GFL era and the Crypt era, which precedes the GFL era by 200 years. So Crypt is 500 years from now, GFL is 700 years from now. Uh, really an enormous amount of work has gone into that timeline to make it analogous to our timeline in that, you know, as Americans, we don't sit around and curse our British overlords all that often, nor right. do we and hold grudges against my great, 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 great granddad, for example, that might have got killed at Valley Forge. And the World Cup was just on and we yep. were able to, I mean, we were rooting for the U.S. because they are great players, but also we're able to not, not... um feel like it was an injustice that England was also playing. Correct. That kind of Correct. thing. Yeah. yeah. It's an interesting thing that you don't really think about unless you think about it in a fiction sense, but we do every day. It's one of the more challenging things about my writing style and my world building style because the easy trope in science fiction is we are either at war with those pers- those that government or we just had a war and everybody hates each other. It's it's humans well, and it's Cylons. It's Klingons so- and Federation. Or you've solved it and now this is supposed to be like that happens in Star Trek. Like this is the utopia. And that is also just recently sorted and solved. Yeah. Just recently. Or Logan's Run is the same way. Just mm-hmm. recently created and solved like in the last 20 years. Right. Which is also temporary. Yeah. So there's an enormous amount of warring history, shifting alliances in the timeline of the Siglerverse, which you can find at uh, Siglerpedia. Uh, Siglerpedia.scottsigler.com is an enormous amount of information on the GF on the timeline. So you can look some of the stuff up there, but the timeline's massive. It covers seven centuries. And there's been a lot of kissing and making up, betrayal, war, kissing Mm -hmm. and making up, Mm -hmm. recycles, repeat. Okay. These next questions are from the Condor, Junkie the Condor. The Condor. All right. Uh, The first one is, is, these are the first Reef-related questions. Okay. The first one is, does Fluff have any relatives that play in the GFL? I don't think Fluff has any relatives left alive. So the (laughs) answer is no. The Heavy Key are an interesting species for uh, the, the GFL series because they're so big that they are just not very mobile. It takes a really unique heavy key athlete who can still have the mobility just because you're a giant human being doesn't mean you can make it in the NFL. There's several 400 pound people who have tried to make it and they don't have the lateral movement, the speed, the hand speed, they don't have the strength and they can't react when people run around them. And the heavy key are in that. So there's not many heavy key in the but we've, AGFL. We've also found the interesting thing about that is we've also found that true in, a, in, in earth-based modern sports uh, for the small end of the spectrum too. Like okay. Kyler Murray right now, everybody's like, ah, I don't know. Yeah. He's real, he's real he's little, real little. Yeah. And uh, like Spud Webb in the NBA back in the day, that yep. was another like, why is that tiny short man in the NBA? He's five, well. six. But the reason <laughs> is because he was unique. So it yeah, doesn't mean was, that every giant, right. And that, so fluff is not an outlier for his species, but there may be a, a heavy key who could manage in the GFL, but they would be the outlier too. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Uh, the next question is John Feed is John Tweedy a fan of the of event that I'll start over. Next question. Okay. <laughs> is John Tweedy a fan of the MMA? I think John Tweedy is a fan of everything. Uh, also, I few... love that. He's also like a huge <laughs> fan of beer, a he huge likes... fan of probably something like pickles or saltines or yes. something like everything yes. he loves. He loves. If you were to pull out Uno, he would probably lose <laughs> his mind. Oh my gosh, you guys going to play Uno? <laughs> Let me get on it. I got to get some of this. What about Yahtzee? Yahtzee. Oh my God. It's like Yahtzee! my favorite. It's great. Yahtzee! <laughs> uh, so yes, he is a fan. Also, if you are asking that question, I'm going to assume you haven't listened to Title Fight. Or maybe you don't remember, haven't read The Starter, book two of the Galactic Football League series, in which John makes uh, makes no bones about his love for MMA. True. Okay, this next question is from Brian Leach. He says, uh, actually, not so much a question as a comment. Okay. Uh, longtime ja- junkie, passing all the Sigler crack to customers. I work as an appliance repair tech in Michigan, from Ann Arbor to Dearborn. And also from Milan to Flint. If mm-hmm. I see a sci-fi horror book in that house, I share my no- my Sigler knowledge. Thank you for all your books. He does ask a question at the end. I think okay. he was just se- sending that in to say thanks so much. Um, and that is a thing that anybody listening can do. If you know somebody who's seen a horror movie they like, seen a sci-fi movie they like, share the love. It. I've talked to so many people. Uh, I don't want to. I don't want to sound like a politician here, but I've talked to many people this weekend. Yes, at Comic Con. I mean, it is Comic Con. It yeah. is at Comic Con, and who have come up, and a, a lot of it's their first time ever meeting me. And the thing they're primarily the most excited about is the GFL. Yeah, and they come up and they say, "I share it with everybody I can. I push this book on people," and that really is 
the single biggest way to share the love. Also, people, it's a mission for people. They're, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Evan- they're evangelists. Yeah. Because almost all these people are like, I didn't think I would like it. I thought I'd give it a try, but yeah. I didn't. I knew it wasn't for me. And then they fall in love with it. So now they look at other people like, you don't think this is for you, but this is for you. And it's a funny thing. I always... I hear so many people, because I get most of the email, I'm the first of us to approach the email that comes in to contact Mm -hmm. us at, or, you know, info at emptyset.com, which is where you should send any question you ever have. Mm -hmm. But I mostly see them first because you're always under, you know, you're writing. And I probably once a week at this point, if not more, get an email that says, look, I had listened and read every single thing you wrote, every anthology, every, every, everything. Except I don't like football, so I never picked up the GFL. So yeah. finally, I was jonesing, and I picked up the GFL, and I read all four books in a month, or yep. all six books in a month, or all five books in a month, and all the novellas. And so that's the thing I say all the time. Like, people are, I frame it a different way. Like, I get the idea, like, I I am that girl. I didn't like, at one point, it, it, I did not like sports, but I didn't like sports. It just wasn't yes. a thing I was paying attention to. Mm-hmm. But you know what else? I never, I never paid attention to wizards either. <laughs> I never paid attention to sparkly vampires either. Right. And I tried, I tried the sparkly vampires. They personally were not for me, yeah. but I loved the wizards and this is the same thing. So I say that all the time. People are like, ah, I don't really think I like football. It's like, cool. Did you really, really love wizards before Harry Potter? No, you did not. Yeah. There's not a thing. And that actually is a framework because then it's easy to see the framework that the story is about the kids it's set in Hogwarts. Set, yeah, it's a story about this these kids set in Hogwarts. This is a story about Quentin and Becca and John and 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 Jew, and it's set in a football field. It's set instead. against the backdrop of a football yeah. league. So remember, kids, anytime you meet someone who likes football, you should suggest this to them. Yeah, you see them in a jersey? <laughs> if you see them in a jersey, suggest it. Anytime you see someone who likes sci-fi of any kind, action movies, Predator, Alien, anything along those lines, John Wick, you should suggest this to them. And I will say that at 10 bucks a pop, is that the co- cost of the paperback? Mm-hmm. One of the best Christmas presents you can give someone True. is and... the rookie in paperback or gifted as an audio book and people can check it out and uh, you'll turn them on. They'll, they'll love you. And if you liked John Wick and you know you liked John Wick, even though it was so crazy pants, <laughs> I will say that we are better in one respect. How's that? You know. Nothing ever happens to the dog. Nothing ever happens. To <laughs> Nothing ever happens to the dog in the Sigler story. And yeah. that is a promise from the mouth of the man himself. Yeah. Can't do anything. I can do anything to anybody anytime, but just can't bring myself to hurt the puppies. Okay. So uh, Brian did have a question right at the end Shoot. of his little, uh, his email, which was, I have been very patiently and continue to wait very patiently on Crypt Part 2. Is there any updates on the timeline? Um, Okay, so I'm going to run this down. This is the other conversation I've had nonstop at Comic-Con. And it's, uh, I'm appreciative of it because people like it and they want to hear it. And I absolutely want to get in and give it to you. I have to do the final draft of GFL 6. It's next on the list. Final draft of Mount Fitzroy. Final draft of The Killer, which is a big, long GFL novella. Uh, and, and, the, and then the final draft of The Alien's Phalanx. Mm-hmm. So there's four final drafts I have to do. Uh, final drafts take a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. And, but they are not a first draft. But so we, right. we, A thinks we'll get to the, the crypts after those. Am I missing the anything? The crypt is, is that, well, okay. Right now, all other things being equal, the crypt will be after those. And I anticipate that to be between Q, probably Q2 and Q3 of next year, but maybe Q1 when and Q2. When I get to it? or When you start. When I start to, I start yeah, to when it. you start it. Okay. And that, the thing here is, and it's such a nebulous and difficult thing. We're such a small company. And really, you're the only creator mm-hmm. that... You have to take things as they come. So now that we can talk about Aliens fa- Phalanx, that came right in the midst of us, you know, doing GFL 6 and The Killer yeah. and Fitzroy yeah. and all that. That's why they're not first drafts, because we were working on those. Um, but it's your favorite franchise. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, you know, it's you do this every day, all day, and you'll do this every day, all day for the rest of your career. And it matters that you write something that's important to you. So not that, not that. The crypt is not important to you, but yeah. you have to take it as it comes. And we got this opportunity for you to write canon stuff in the Aliens universe, and that was really important to us. So we shifted things aside. That said, all other things being equal, you'll get to the crypt March, April, May-ish of next year. Okay. But I don't know if all other things will remain equal. <laughs> we'll see. Because <laughs> other things may pop up. Just finish right. the screenplay of that shoots. So we have to see what happens there. But I will go on record. I'm calling my shot at the end of the day when I'm on my deathbed or in my coffin, uh, whatever, the crypt will be the thing that I am remembered for. That'll be the big one. So yep. we're, we're coming up on it. Yep. Uh, okay. So uh, David Dysart has a question about Earth Core. All right. And it's this. 
The silver bugs in Earth Core, when they were shot, there's a smell of burnt chocolate. What's causing that? I don't know the advanced chemistry of that one, David. You got me. You got me. There's some uh, some bioorganic, m- metalloorganic within them that's probably in their processor unit that allows them to do all the fast calculations and the distributed network. But, but I think more to his question, I mean, that's the actual physics answer. Yeah. Of what is it? We don't know what would make it smell like theobroma oh, or whatever. Okay. But okay. I think the reason you do that is the same as the as the guy shaving in Predator. It's a It's a... You, you talk about it. You're in, writing, in writing, there's various techniques. If I can introduce a character and have them do, and Stephen King is uh, the master of this. Um, Stephen King will introduce a character, will give them one vocal tick and one physical descriptor that's unique and one mannerism that's unique. And these things are usually for secondary characters, like boom, 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 one paragraph. You've got those three things installed and one or two or all three of those things is going to catch in your head and now the character becomes memorable Mm -hmm. and he will also use uh different all the different sensations the way something looks the way something sounds the way something smells even the way something tastes and this is a device that a lot of writers use if i can if i can associate a character or an event with a particular smell that is not a common everyday smell it's like Mm -hmm. you know they they smell like burn like the the creatures in the Generations trilogy smell like burnt toast or wet burnt toast. Mm-hmm. That's a smell most people know, but you don't smell it every day, but you smell it enough that you know it, and now you associate it. It activates a different part of your brain, yeah. and that makes, because you are engaging a part of your brain that exists and does things in the, re- in the real world, in real life, now this fictitious thing that is only in your imagination suddenly feels more real. Yeah, and I'll say, like, the I didn't quite understand this. When we first started to work together, this was really important to you to give little off, like, off um, the critical path, uh, you know, comments or ticks or whatever to some mm-hmm. of your characters. And a zillion years ago, you we had a conversation where you were like, tell me what you know about Kojak. Mm-hmm. Kojak is bald and always has lollipops. Yep. So I know that even though I know I watched Kojak, I know I liked Kojak, if you're young enough that you've never heard that name before, the actor's name was Telly Savalas, it was a cop show, mm-hmm. and he was a cop and solved things, and um, I can't tell you one single thing that he did, but I can tell you <laughs> those things, and that, because I can instantly call up what that his mannerisms were and that kind of thing, and that's right. what you're doing there, that's the burnt chocolate, and the other thing is you see it to, used to great effect where a character who doesn't know that, doesn't know that, They'll smell like, when they're dying, they smell like burnt chocolate or whatever. Start, what it, do you smell that? that? Like that kind of thing. It's so powerful, I think. It's and, powerful. But that's why. But I also if, love that you were like, I don't know why it smells like burnt chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> if I do it, if, if I do this correctly, I get into your subconscious at a level, subconscious or subconscious? Yes. Yes. I get into your subconscious at a level where the next time a silver bug gets shot, and the action is really heavy. And I don't say it smells like burnt chocolate. You smell burnt chocolate when you're reading the part. And then I, I own you. I have you at that point. And it's really fun. Okay. So we, like we said at the top of the hour here, we are uh, kind of doing this live. And I'm going to try playing an MP3. Okay. Just live into the feed. And we're not going to edit it. It might sound a little kludgy, but we're going to go for it. Here we go. You ready? Yep. All righty. Hey Scott, it's Mike, an original junkie from Atlanta, Georgia. Hey, I'm not going to nitpick you on the reef because I've really enjoyed it. But I have a right. couple of questions on character names. Hit me. In the GFL series, the captain of the touchback is Kate Cheevers. Uh-huh. In this other podcast, The Black Evolution, there's a character named Kate Cheever. And huh. you know who did this one? It's Polly e. Cooley. You've worked with him before. How come the names are so similar? Also, one of the main characters in his book is the last name of Sigler. Mm-hmm. So I guess he did that as an homage to you. How do you work with other authors in using names and crossovers? Thanks, and I can't wait for GFL 6. Well, I will say this. Hey, Scott, it's Mike, an original junkie. (laughs) Back in the day, we when ScottSigler.com was basically its own social media site and pre-Facebook. That's how old we are, you guys, pre-Facebook. And we had an incredibly active, vibrant community of awesome people who were not only interacting with me in the stories, they're interacting with each other and forming lifelong friendships. Um, some of those people would participate in the site quite a lot. And we had a system called crack hits. So you, the more you participate in the site, 
you kind of rose in the rankings. And then eventually, if you were high enough in the rankings when I wrote a story, we would grab your name and put you in a story. It was super fun. It's not ever going to happen again. That ship has completely sailed. But Kate Cheevers was one of those fans yep. and was very active. And super interactive. Still is super interactive, super interactive on Facebook. Yeah. And I assume she was also super interactive in Paul Cooley's fan community. And uh, he, I, there's a term for it. I can't remember what it is. But uh, a term for taking a person from real world and putting their oh, name like into your book. Oh, like or... It's something, like something along those lines. Something, yeah. along those lines. So um, as far as working with other authors, it's always an honor when another author will use your name. Uh, Jeremy Robinson has a Jack Sigler character. He's got a whole franchise around, which uh, has me in it. And there's a, Seth Harwood has done it, a couple other people. And it's always... One of those more overwhelming, flattering things that I I don't know how to respond you, you still, to. Still, even at this moment, <laughs> you're answering and giggling. I'm like, like oh I'm my god, god okay, you. thanks. Okay, thank uh, you. Uh, like, because you just, even though I'm, you know, boisterous and over the top, and normally in all the things that I do, when somebody pays you that kind of honor, you're just like a little like, I don't know how to handle. Yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. You do the same thing when people send in tattoos that they have oh, yeah. from their stories. You're yeah. like, but that's gonna be there forever. <laughs> like, yeah, that's why they did it. That's yeah. the point. Yep. All right, moving on. Um, Joseph Bolvin has a handful of questions. Uh, the first one is, when did you create the Sigliverse timeline and all the planets therein? Was it a teenage endeavor that, or one that you dabbled with over the years? It's pretty tight and brilliant so far, so I have to ask how it came to be. We actually have that. We have in the Sigler archives, we bring it with us to Siglerfest, is the original written on a royal typewriter that my mom got at a garage sale or something like that. The original timeline typed out when I was in the sixth grade. So I've been working on this, I believe, since the summer before my sixth grade. Um, that's a very, it's, it's a long time. Trust me, it's a really long time. I started doing the timeline then, and that was before I had the concept of the GFL. So I did this whole timeline because I just loved sci-fi. I love timelines. And I was also annoyed with, even in the sixth grade, I was annoyed with bad plots and the over super the superficial timelines. I'm like, dude, these things sound like the history is five years. History is much longer than five years. I um, this is a little aside, but I think it makes sense. I often think um, when I have friends who are ha- they have a six or seven or eight year old, mm-hmm. that is understand. I understand that that's the time that your individual personality develops, mm-hmm. kind of, and so that's also when you're in the first grade. So I think your individual personality is developing and you're a sort of person you're you're young scott Ziegler who really really likes compl- you can follow a complex plot as long as it pays off you're happy mm-hmm. i don't know what you read when you were in the sixth grade but that worked whatever it was yeah I read every everything. everything paid off and you were like this this is my life goal yeah it was- this is my life goal <laughs> to watch as entertainment as well and so you are not you're t- still to this day you appreciate even if it's a ludicrous pay, like if it works internally in the story if it's co- internally consistent and logical within itself can be and non non real in the in, in yeah. on earth you don't care it just has to pay off and that's still true today for you yes and i now remember i i remember typing this because i had one of those 80s movie moments where i'm just typing away typing away typing away and my parents like open up the door to my room and they both kind of lean in and my mom is a little shorter than my dad so like she opens the doors but like leans in and he's over the top of her because you know they were like honey he's he's typing again oh let's go let's go take wonder wonder what he's typing oh maybe he'll be a writer i don't know and they like <laughs> i didn't know that at the time but now i know and they come in they look and i'm typing i'm typing and i look out, and i look out and i'm like what? <laughs> so well, that's, that and was... then they just faded back out of the room. And that was the summer after my fourth grade year. So that's how long I've been working on this timeline. That's fantastic. He has another question that I think he's got a bunch of questions, but this one I think we'll also ask. Um, do when the GFL becomes a movie, are you allowed to play a cameo yes. or a recurring role? Yes. And if so, what would it be? Well, that will be up to uh, the directors and the producers, but I guarantee you, Anybody makes anything visual out of anything I've ever done, and in the contract will be, I get a cameo. Stan Lee, of course, has done it forever. Stephen King has done it forever. I honestly don't know why more authors don't do it. Yeah, I, of I, 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 I don't I've never either. understood this. And the, I, the thing is, it's, you realize eventually that people are very different, and most authors just don't care. They don't, they're not that into it. Um, but yeah, I will be in everything. I will f- push for a speaking part. But we will see because I'm not a professional actor and that final decision is not up to me. That's up to the people who write the checks. Okie doke. Uh, another earth, this is an earth court question. 
Scott, is there any way Kayla Myers could still be alive after the events of Earth Court? This is your spoiler warning, friends, your mid-episode spoiler warning. Mm. Connell hi- heard her scream, and she was badly injured. But he did it in a not direct, he did not directly witness her de- death. There is at least one other exit from the mountain we've seen in the story. And there may be others, of course, because the water in the river has to flow somewhere, and the spring just isn't very big. Could Kayla have survived and come back from Mount Fitzroy? I cannot answer that question at this time. Mm. I cannot answer that question. Sorry about that. Uh, that might be too much of a spoiler for Mount Fitzroy, but uh, it's a, I'm going to do a non-denial denial. Okay. He has another question. Okay. Uh, one of the things I love about your books is that often the horror and tragedy is as much psychological as it is physical, and the psychological part to me is usually more of a gut punch. Examples. Spoilers. Uh, Dewey, f- um, uh, Perry Dossie from Infected uses his anger and, quote, discipline to cut out the triangles, but at the cost of reverting to the violent, violent, scary Perry that he was, right. that he had previously learned to control. Mm-hmm. So his question is, do you set out to include these kinds of tragedies in advance as you're outlining the plot? Sorry, that's the my alarm to feed the dogs. That's okay. Um, or is it more something that grows organically as you write? That is, do you plan out the gut punch at the end of your novels the same way you plan out the big Hollywood-style set-piece endings? It depends. It depends on what's going on in my life at, the, at that time, what my personal experience is, and what kind of what's pissing me off, I guess. And at the time I wrote Infected, I was still heavily, much deeper into athletics than I am right now. Um, a bigger fan of a lot of things. And I was still always so annoyed by the constant disrespect from academia towards athletes and the the uh, kind of pop culture dismissal of the intelligence of athletes. So that's always at the forefront of everything I do. That's why if you read the GFL, the players in the GFL are actual living, breathing, sentient creatures with intelligence and their own wants and desires and not some comic book caricature of the dumb athlete or the dumb lineman, which you read in most sci-fi is full of dumb athletes. And not just that. I mean, I, and I, I talk about this all the time. I, again, I wasn't a person who didn't like sports, but mm. I was a person who didn't really pay attention to sports. Just like many of you listening now kind of don't pay a lot of attention to fencing. You know it yes. exists. Yep. You don't hate it or love it. Right. You don't think about it. Yes. But even me as a, I don't really think about this much. It's super easy. You know, the dumb jock is the dumb jock archetype for a reason. And the reason isn't because jocks are dumb. It's that we assume if you can't do something with your brain, you do something with your hands. And they are somehow disassociated, or something with your body. And those are disassociated things, but they're not disassociated. And especially in football, they're not disassociated. And you get some of the same prejudicial beliefs with people who work with their hands and HVAC and auto guys and people who, uh, it's, and it's, It'll never go away. But what what I was looking at when I did infect was also, um, you know, part of the dismissal of athletes was a lack of respect and appreciation for the amount of hard work they put in and the amount of the amount of toughness that goes in. If you're going to be a high level volleyball player, if you're going to be a high level cheerleader, uh, uh, the tumbly type cheerleaders mm-hmm. who do all the flips and stuff, competitive yeah. cheer, if you're a high level football player, high level basketball player, you're going to endure an enormous amount of physical damage that people in day-to-day life do not choose to endure and maybe can or can endure. So with Perry, it was, okay, uh, there's the cycle of violence. And where I come from in northern Michigan, like a lot of rural rural areas in in America and probably around the world, the cycle of violence is very sad and tragic and perpetuates and that the kids who get beat up by their parents tend to be the parents who beat up their kids. And But also looking at that, some of the guys I played football with who got the crap kicked out of them by their parents were the toughest people I've ever met in my entire life. And they could go on a football field and just lay damage like nothing. And when people would just lay them out, smash them, they'd pop right up and there was nothing to it. So there for all the tragedy of their upbringing, some benefit came out of that, that proved to be an asset in their life and gave them an advantage. And I wanted to explore that with Perry. Mm-hmm. So from a couple perspectives, like, yes, he's a terrible child. There's no excuse for it. it's terrible. It also made him an elite athlete because he was tough enough to be strong enough to endure the work to, to, to be good at the right. game. And it's one of those things that we're actually, well, not me personally, but the uh, NFL is dealing with now because the reality is in all situations, yeah, but this point. is a perfect one. That you have to integrate those. Like, yeah, Perry suffered, and that made him a better athlete. But the thing that would make him a better, happier human would be 
if he didn't have to be one or the other. Right. If it could be, yes, this gave me this, but it also took away a huge amount that I need help getting back. I need help socializing and I need help feeling safe if I'm talking to a stranger and yes. things like that. And that's, I think, especially for infected is one of those, like he knows he's losing, like he knows, he almost knows that he's choosing that. He's choosing to give back in to Scary Perry. Mm -hmm. And that's, impossibly hard because the reality should have been he should have had help for that he should have yes. not had to wall it up he should have been able to have help for that so. he should have been able to get get therapy and get through all of that yeah. but that's one of those one of the catch-22s about these situations is there are a lot of guys and i'm assuming a lot of women too i didn't play on teams with women so i don't sure, know for sure but there are a lot of athletes playing at elite levels who would not be there probably if it wasn't for their single-minded focus and their toughness which sometimes comes from very negative circumstances. Well, so not it's only. not a positive that they're negative, but you look at it, you're like, yeah, that guy would not be an NFL player with all of this money in this life if he hadn't had all of this struggle he faced when he was younger. Right, yeah. And you look at that, and, and that's for me, like I said, that sort of growing into being a football fan, that's mm -hmm. one of the really remarkable things is it's – it's super easy for me to say like, yeah, why didn't you use a brain or whatever, which right. I never did, but I could have like, yeah, okay, fine. You play games for a living mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. that you hear all that bullshit all the time. And the reality is I could have chosen everything too. Would I like to be an aerospace engineer? Yeah, sure. But that wasn't in the cards for me. That's right. not how I'm built. Mm -hmm. So to say you could do anything and you're choosing to play a game is super shitty. Super shitty. Yeah. And the final answer for him is uh, writing is success and tragedy it's happiness and sadness and i what i specifically want to play with infected was he's the only guy to survive this because of his traumatic childhood single-minded focus and his toughness mm. and so that's i wanted you to feel bad both ways i wanted you to feel bad this was happening well, to him <laughs> and i wanted you to feel bad that the only way for him to survive was to regress to something that he had wanted to put behind him so he elevated beyond his past but he had to get his past back in order to survive and that's that's people that's what you are okay so moving on um what, how, how long have we been going? That's about 36 minutes. We'll okay keep rolling. Okay if, if we go too long, guys, we're going to make this a double, a double episode. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so this is from the only uh, email address is Heart of Death, So, but there's no name. Okay. Um, I like oh, it. Sean. Sean. Sean, um, Heart of Death. Yeah, Heart of Death. Uh, was the story arc for the reef always the same? And what percentage of the book did you end up writing? I don't really understand that question. Well, is there more to the question? Well, there was an, an initial, his first question is, can we write them all together? Um, or can we, he buy them all together? Can we um, put together a complete collection so he can buy them in one neat package? And not I was going to answer that question. Oh, go ahead. Next and say not uh, yet. I, I, the Reef was, uh, Matt and I worked on it. and, oh, and I get came, it. Yeah, we came up with it. But I, I, I can't really answer your question because I don't know. I don't remember enough if earlier drafts had different endings. Yeah, and I remember a little bit about... So, of course, The Reef is, is somewhat of a sequel to Title Fight, even though it's not quite a sequel to right. Title Fight. Title Fight was absolutely written where you were one fighter, Matt Wallace was another fighter, right. and mm -hmm. you traded off chapters from perspective of one fighter to the other fighter. And then at the end, when the story goes out of the octagon, it's you who wrote that part of that story, the, the book end of that mm -hmm. story. Coming into this, this was also a collaboration, but because it wasn't set up like a fight I, with 12 rounds or whatever, um, it was a little more nebulous. And uh -huh. since there's only one point of view character instead of the two, you guys went back and forth about that. If I had to say, I would say that this was a little bit more, maybe a sixty forty, where you wrote a little bit more than Matt did because it wasn't it wasn't you developing the whole character but by and the, him developing. The by whole the character. time we got to the point where we want to finish this off and put it out to market, it had already been half done for maybe five years. A long time, yeah. And then the GFL universe had changed and things had changed, so some some changes had to go there. I would like to point out though that uh, everybody's listening to this right now obviously enjoyed the reef. Matt Wallace has a series out called Sin Du Jour, and it is about a supernatural paranormal catering company. In New York, yeah. In New York. And Matt is an exceptional writer. You should look up Matt Wallace and look up look him up on Amazon, Matt Wallace, Sin Du Jour, and you can see all the stuff he's got available. And I will say, I really love the Sin Du Jour series. One of the things I really love about it is if you have read the, the contributions that Matt has made to the Sigler verse, or you have read some of Matt's early books... 
he is a lot like you. He's a very visceral, very physical, very sort of violent writer. Mm -hmm. That is all still true in Sin Du Jour. He's very visceral. It's a very violent story. It is also awesomely funny. And it's interesting to see it juxtaposed. Your, especially me, I'm used to seeing like gritty, gritty, visceral, gritty, violent, yeah. gritty, physical. And this is all that, but it's not gritty. It's really fun. It's fun. And in book one, they uh, have to catch an angel and cook it and eat it. So it's yeah, great. They do. Uh, another question from Sean. He says, if you could estimate how many books you still have in your head oh, for Jesus. each timeline, what would it be? And the timelines oh. he points out are present, <clears throat> GFL, uh, crypt and the future uh, GFL there will be book six seven and eight and one more novella which we talked about as a killer and then that series is completely done unless people show up with truckloads full of money uh, the crypt also probably one boatload one one boatload would be fine it would be fine the crypt my vision for the crypt is to probably write four five six books depending but it's all about getting three full seasons of TV lined up and the books contain sort of the the episodes, so it's Battlestar Galactica ish, where it's not episodic. You have to watch them in order. You can't watch them out of order. And my long term goal is to do three season TV show with that property, and then it's done. So it doesn't get stretched out and turn into crap like Lost, for example. Um, and it's not eighteen. It doesn't need eighteen seasons, so it won't finish. But three and out. And then modern day is. Um, there will be no limit on that. The limit on that will be when I croak. Okie doke. So uh, since we are sort of in the second half of this, I'm going to scoot a little quickly through some other questions. Okay. Darren Pride asks, um, This is he wants to know from you, but he asks this of all authors, does a book series be- ever become an albatross around your neck? Yes. And he says, do you desperately want to write new stories, but fans demand the continuation of other characters? Yes. And I also want to, I want to finish the st- the series because I am also a fan of the series. So don't get me wrong. I mean, I love the GFL, but the GFL is an enormous amount of work to the point where we have a contractor who reads through everything to make sure it fits into the timeline mm-hmm. and we haven't screwed up the history and we haven't screwed up the continuity. So it's when you, when you write book one of a series, the world is your oyster. You can do anything you want. You create all this wonderful, lush world. By the time you get to book five, there's a huge rule structure in place that you have to follow so you don't screw up and do something that doesn't make any sense. So it's a lot harder to write book six, seven, and eight than it is to write book one. So yes, I want to be, I want to finish it right for you guys. I want to be one, blow you away. And book eight will absolutely blow you away, but I'm looking forward to being done. <laughs> okay, so Paul Stevenson wrote, uh, three questions that I'm going to ask you to answer in a rapid fire way because I think they're going to work. But okay. first he says, first of all, a great shout out for Dynalition references in the reef. Thank you for that. Cool. Um, and I hope that you reconsider visiting the world of Pete and Bess again someday. Uh, they will be back um, somewhere. I can't tell you, but they will be back. The questions. And these are rapid fire answers, Mr. Singler. Okay. If you could or would write a story for a comic book, which character of yours would you choose? Oh, no. Which character would you choose? You can pick one Marvel and one DC. Oh, if I was to write out yeah. of there? Mm-hmm. Oh, gosh. It has to be Marvel and DC? Uh, uh, I guess it, he says you can pick one Marvel and one DC, but I'm saying you could pick whichever Well, first character. of all, I would like to write Mike Barron's Badger. That is the one. That is my favorite of all time. That is the one I would like to write. Um, if it was Marvel, oh, gosh, there's so much cool shit in Marvel. I'm pro- It's got to be... It's probably something Punisher related. Fair. I'd like to write something Punisher related. Um, I would like to write something Daredevil related, but frankly, the first two seasons of the Daredevil TV show were so fucking good. I, yeah, I don't. Think, and that's really nice to see that yeah, they like, did so well. It's hard to top that shit. I mean, what about Juggernaut? I I'd love, love Juggernaut. I'd love to write Juggernaut. <laughs> that would be great. Um, let's see. DC. That's a little harder. I'm not a big DC fan. Everything seems too weird and overpowered. So DC existing character. I'd probably like. Um, I, I don't know. I so got, you're choosing I got Badger and Punisher. That's fine. Yeah, I'm choosing Badger <laughs> and Punisher. And DC, I would have to put a little bit more thought into. Okay, second question in our rapid fire round. Which story of yours would you like to see in comic book slash graphic novel format? I actually do have a pitch for a nocturnal related property. Uh, and that we we had a contract with IDW for it, but then they restructured and they dropped some projects. Yeah. So they dropped that. Yeah, yeah. So that is the one I would also really like to see Hunter Hunterson and Sons in comic book That's form. That's me. Yeah. And then third, would you rather fight 50 duck sized horses or one horse sized duck? One horse sized duck. No Why? question. Because ducks fear fire. 
I, okay. Yes, it's well known. Ducks fear fire. What does fire. that have to do with a Because I get one duck. flamethrower and I don't have to lay down fire across a wide arc. I have to come straight at the horse-sized duck and then it but will run away. But it's a duck as big as a horse. Yeah, That's when a those, big duck. When those feathers catch fire, we're going to be eating real good for weeks, I just, buddy. I don't think the duck is kind of gamey. Oh, that's I don't like duck. I forgot. <laughs> okay. Uh, Benjamin Ritters asked, will there ever be a sequel to Tentacles, Tentacles, and More Tentacles? <laughs> no. No, there will not. Do you want to explain what Tentacles, Tentacles, Oh, Tentacles, and more Tentacles, Tentacles is the technically the first book I ever published. It was one of, I think it was in the third grade where you go through the art project we actually make your own book with some kind of wallpaper cover and you fold the paper inside and then you were to write a story of course everybody else is at that age is writing here's my story about flowers here's my story about my puppy and my mom and i love my family (laughs) and i wrote a story called tentacles tentacles and more tentacles about a cruise ship that was torn apart by a giant sea monster and everybody got eaten and drowned and then the sea monster attacked the west coast of the United States and destroyed Los Angeles, San Francisco before it got wiped out by a nuclear it missile. It did have a lot of tentacles. And a lot of tentacles. And I'm not making it up. That sounds funny. I literally called it tentacles, tentacles, and more tentacles. And for your information, if you go to YouTube, search for tentacles, tentacles, more tentacles, Sigler, you will find it when I read it in front of a packed house at a Dragon Con. Yeah. Okay. So this is another audio question. Okay. Here we go. Hello, Scott and A. This is Tony in Arizona. I have one and only one quick criticism about the GFL universe, and that is the use of the word shuck. I understand why you use it, but I like my Sigler burger. (laughs) Extra spicy and salty. Anyways, on with my question. When Kyle is questioning the sheriff, I felt that he went a little too far in that the sheriff poses no threat at all to Kai and is in his complete control, so it seems as if he was almost becoming what he is supposed to be getting rid of. He did express some regret about tearing up the market and robbing the other fighter. So the question is, when you have a character like Kyle, how do you balance the use of violence and still have him be a relatable, I guess we'd call him good guy? I do like the fact that a lot of your characters are flawed and have struggles and are not just black and white. For A, have you ever found yourself really questioning a character in that you really didn't like him and her when maybe you were supposed to. Thanks, guys. Hope I didn't go on too long. No worries. Uh, Answer the question. Um, You know, Kyle is, there's some kind of psychological disorder there somewhere, some sociological issue. And when he gets his dander up, he will push something well beyond the point where somebody's already given him a satisfactory answer. He gets himself into trouble. He's a lot like a lot of people who are in the fight game. And they're in the fight game because they like to start fights and they they can't help but push it and he goes too far. He's had several situations where if he just would have if he just would have behaved and been normal, yeah. he wouldn't have wound up in that bad situation. He sort of can't help himself and he's sort of a dick. And and in a couple of situations he he knows better. He knows like this will all be fine. And absolutely goes in for the trouble because that's yep. what he prefers. That's yep. he he has the moment he knows it's there and he chooses what he wants instead of what he should choose. Mm-hmm. Uh to answer my question, there's not really characters or I, I will say this, there are and I'm not gonna give you the examples of what those are because I think they're quite personal. There are we were talking a little bit earlier about character traits that you create as as kind of hooks so that I can remember the character. And there are a couple that are meant to be annoying and they are the right amount of grinding for me that I'm like, Oh, I hope they don't come back kind of thing. (laughs) Or I hope, you know, and, uh, um, Dr. Cool is not one of them for me, but it's that sort of thing. He's so incredibly annoying. How Mm -hmm. can you not hate him? Right. Those little hooks. There are a few that I, I, I don't prefer. Um, but I think that's the point and, and that's why they're there. And I, there's actually not a character or a story that I don't like that you've written that I can think of. Um, and uh, people always ask me, a handful of people asked me last night at our open house, my favorite Sigler story is a short story called Red Man. Mm-hmm. Um, that, I think, is this pitch perfect, oh my goodness, we all have to exist with each other, and yet we are all always alone kind of a story. Um, and that can, I think that might, might be in Blood is Red. Uh, I you think can so, listen yeah. to it or, or buy it if you want to, but that's my favorite Sigler story. Okie doke. Um, Morgan Merchant writes, I have been a listener since nearly the beginning. I have been loving your work for many years. Um, The vast and rich universe you have built uh, with that universe. Have you ever thought about a role-playing game? No. Um, Well, actually, technically, we've thought about probably every kind of adaptation you can think of. 
at some point or another, because this is, you know, 15 years of this now, um, but we do not think about those things anymore because we are trying to focus on, on our core, our core business is writing books. We want to do that. All, all the other stuff that I've done at the end of the day, you put a book in a bookstore and it's up in the audible store. It will sell as a digital product, sell for the next 20 or 30 years. And that's what puts food on the table and all the other stuff just distracts us that the reason yeah. we are so far behind in everything is because I've allowed myself to be distracted by so I many mean, shiny I think that's objects a choice that we made. But I do also think that there's a difference between, you know, uh, I don't know, like making a stranger things, for example, RPG or something. Mm-hmm. That's a super high, uh, highly recognized, highly known quantity where the people. So if, the people who make Dungeons and Dragons come and say, we want to do this. That is, they're coming with a huge amount of resources yeah. and everything else because there's so much source material for them to work on. That is not a place where we currently are. So what happens when we have these opportunities, and they definitely come in with frequency, mm-hmm. um, is, right, but we're going to need Scott's input for like six months or yeah. two months or we, six weeks we or whatever. That. And that is not, for us, we've made a choice that we want to finish several ongoing properties that we are working on. And at that point, several things could happen. Somebody could come and be like, cool, I have this entire staff. I want to build a video game based on the GFL and I just need your licensing permission. Cool. I can make a licensing agreement. That can go on. Right. What we can't do is have you write how all those write all the character descriptions, write how they interact with each other. We can't do that. Yeah, we're, and that's a place where we're at right now. We're, so I think possibly someday people will come back and say, cool, now that now that nocturnal or you know now that nocturnal is this known out in the world property, mm-hmm. I have come with this great big pitch and I would like to do it, and that we would absolutely consider. But at this point, we are choosing to spend your energy, which is finite in a work week, doing um, things that will complete some of the, the stories and stuff that have been ongoing for a long time, so that we can move on and examine other things. For example, we've been pitching nocturnal as a TV show for six years now. And uh, Lloyd Levin, the guy who made Hellboy, Hellboy 2, the most recent Hellboy, Boogie Nights, Green Zone, super established guy in Hollywood. He's been pitching it. The screenwriters were uh, Danny Bilson and Paul DeMeo, who wrote The Rocketeer, among other things. This is a high-powered team we have trying to pitch this, and yet I'm heavily involved in it. And the amount of time I have spent making material for this team to go out and pitch that wound up not resulting in a particular deal or a deal that fell through is easily two full novels worth of time. Oh yeah. Easily. easily. So yeah. we have to, so we've learned from this and we've learned no matter how exciting the opportunity is, we really, I'm really good at one particular thing. So we want to put the vast majority of our time into that one thing I'm really good at. Okie doke. Uh, where are we time wise? We are at 51 minutes. So we have enough left over that I think it might be worth considering letting these lovely people go on with their day and okay. maybe doing a second Q&A episode. We don't have that built into the podcasting right now, but we could either drop it on a Wednesday or something like that. But I think we should stop because I have like another 20 something. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. People are so inquisitive. Yes. 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 You all want to ask all the questions all the time. You're very intruding upon my daily life. So, so we will say this. What we will talk about, uh, I don't know when and if we're going to do the second uh, Q&A where it will go into the timeline. Sure. Um, it could be next Sunday's episode. You're listening to this on a Sunday. This could be your next podcast. It's also possible we might put that out during the week. But whenever we're done with these Q&As, what is the next book that we're going to podcast? The next book is The Detective. The Detective. The, detective. The, de- the next book is The Detective. I know exactly what we're doing. And this is another Scott Sigler, Matt Wallace collaboration. It is. Yeah. So that's, um, we'll wrap it up with this. I will say if any of you are listening to this and listened to The Reef but didn't listen to Title Fight, we ran Title Fight back in the podcast, I'd say maybe six years ago. It's quite a while ago. Mm-hmm. It is not still part of the free fod- podcasting cycle, but you can buy it wherever you buy audiobooks. It is these some of these same characters. It's a different story with Kyle North. If you didn't know that existed, please go check yeah, that out. Yeah, you love Title Fight. Likewise, if you enjoyed especially The Reef, which is not a chapter a chapter for each round of in the octagon. So that's a little bit more um, delineated. Mm-hmm. If you liked this, the way they collaborate together, I really love how Scott and Matt Wallace write together. You should listen to the detective as it's coming up next in your feed anyway, but also it's beautiful and it's a personal story. It's a character driven story about yeah. Frederico Gonzalez, Frederico Esteban Gasipin Gonzalez. Yeah. And uh, who's a regular character in the Galactic football league series. And he's sort of a lighthearted character campy character if you will mm-hmm. uh in the gfl and this is his origin story and it is 
not lighthearted or campy yeah. at all. And it's actually, it's an interesting thing because uh, somebody asked earlier, asked of me um, wh- the, which characters I do and mm-hmm. don't like. And one of the things I love quite a lot about Fred is I think that he is insistently happy and proud of himself and, and like loves his job and stuff because he, he made that choice at some point. And yeah. ch- when he made that choice, I think is after the things that happen in the detective. And he's like, well, if I'm alive, I am going to love my life. You guys are going to dig it. He's yeah. he's a really strong character. Super proud of what Matt and I collaborated on and that. It's 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 one of my more grown up stories. Yeah. Although there's an enormous amount of violence in it, it's <laughs> yes. still I would say it's one of my more grown up stories. So we are going to be back at you uh, sometime soon with the rest of these Q and A's. If you guys didn't hear your question asked, I have them all. I am not ignoring them. If you had if you asked multiple questions, I might not get to all of your questions if you heard some of them here, but I'm going to try. Scott Ziegler, you have to go head out back to Comic-Con here shortly. Yep. Uh, yes. And then Monday, back to work on... Uh, oh, we can't talk about it. What's your back to work on, can we? Or are you going back to work at 6 on Monday? Getting back to work GFL 6. Oh, yeah. final final, draft. final draft of GFL Book 6. And that is called The Gangster. And if you are listening to this and somehow have not yet pre-ordered The Gangster, oh, yes. go to scottsigler.com slash shop and buy pre-order The Gangster. We have... Um, promise that it will be shipped no later than April 1st, which is Sigler Ascension Day in 2020. That mm-hmm. is the only timeline we have right now because it is in just before final draft form. So until I have a final draft, I can't figure out the production timeline. Therefore, we're saying it that way. I don't think it'll be that late, but go ahead and get your copy because we get number them as soon get as you order yep. them. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much for spending the time doing your Thank busy, busy you, Comic Con. Thank you, Director of Doom, for taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. And uh, we will talk to you all real, real soon. soon. You have been listening to The Reef, a Galactic Football League novella. Written by Scott Sigler and Matt Wallace. Narrated by Scott Sigler. Audiobook directed by A.B. Kovacs and engineered by Steve Rickyberg. Copyright 2019 by Empty Set Entertainment. All rights reserved. Theme music is by the band Amps and Voice. <laughs>